you would turn your Bible to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. One week till the world celebrates Easter, uh, which is uh, Resurrection Sunday for every Christian. And uh, we need to be busy about uh, reaching the lost this week, especially. And uh, just, just pray that God would use you this week to, to share His Word, uh, to, to minister to folks, and just to be a blessing. Uh, Acts chapter 14, I, I was going to read uh, most of the chapter, but we're just going to read one verse to get started. Uh, we're going to look down to uh, verse number 14, and it says, Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard, heard of... of excuse me, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and the things that are therein. I want to preach to you a message this morning entitled, What Are You Passionate About? Uh, As I began to read this passage of Scripture, I saw the word, uh, I saw where Paul and Barnabas uh, told these men, and we'll get into the story in in a moment, but he says, we are of like passions as you. you." Uh, That word passion is only used three times in the Bible. Uh, Once in uh, James chapter 5 and verse 17, talking about Elijah, uh, who was a man of like passions, yet he prayed fervently that it would not rain, and it didn't rain for a space of uh, three years and six months. It's used again in Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Uh, where it talks about the passion of Jesus Christ. Uh, That's a different Greek word than these passions. But uh, looking at this verse, I want to ask you this morning, what are you passionate about? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We come before you. Ask that you convict each of our hearts, uh, that as you reveal to us our our heart's desire, our love, that you would help us to focus in on on being more in love with you, uh, to follow your word better, to serve you better, to love you more. And Lord, just please use this time to glorify yourself. Help me to preach the wonderful word of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, what are you passionate about? The word passion here uh, means the feeling of mind or sensible effect of impression, uh, excitement as desire, fear, hope, joy, grief, love, hatred, and zeal. When you ask yourself, what am I most passionate about? Uh, When I began to study this scripture and ponder and meditate on this, I began to, uh, to realize that it's a, a great big subject about people's passion. Uh, as I looked in to study what people are passionate about, uh, the thing that came up was, uh, i give you a list here. Uh, people are passionate about animals. Um, how many in here have a dog or a cat? That's a lot of folks. Uh, here's, a, here's a number. There, in America, there's 77 million dogs. There's 58 million cats in America. Uh, Listen to this number. According to the APP, or the APPA, uh, the the, uh, amount Americans spent on their uh, pets grew in 2020 to $103 billion that are spent on animals in our country. Uh, What about hobbies? Are you passionate about your hobby? That's reading, traveling, fishing, uh, television, music, gardening, uh, maybe video games. Uh, Cooking, collecting, whether it be books, guns, medals, coins, hiking, hunting, uh, social media. What are you passionate about this morning? Uh, What about art? Uh, At an art auction in uh, in, uh, Christie's, New York in 2016 during the Contemporary Art Event, uh, Salvatore Monday by Leonardo uh, da Vinci uh, turned into the most expensive painting ever sold, selling $450 million at the end of a 19-minute bidding war. I would say these people are pretty passionate about art. Uh, what about passionate about learning? When I was growing up, we called these people nerds. No, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> passionate about learning. But seriously, in our country, uh, the, the amount of money that's spent on higher education... Uh, you, I don't want you to raise your hand, but if you spend over $20,000 in your life on education, you're pretty passionate about your learning, uh, the things that you've learned. What about passionate on health and fitness? Our country is nuts about that. Before the pandemic in 2019, the statistic was um, $34.8 billion was spent on gym memberships in our country. I would say pretty, people are pretty passionate about that. As I began to study this and look at this, I, fa- I found this fact uh, where you look, uh, where your billful and your money goes is what you're most passionate about. I, I, did, I did draw that conclusion. Uh, some people are passionate about their career. 
Uh, some people are passionate on teaching. Uh, some people are passionate about politics, uh, especially uh, Governor Greg Abbott down in my home state. Uh, he's so passionate about politics. Uh, if you are an illegal immigrant in his state, uh, he's chartered 900 buses that are going to send to the cities. He's going to load up the illegal immigrants. And if our country is going to go to ruins uh, by illegal immigration, it's going to start in Washington, D.C., uh, because he's going he's gonna to bust those folks to Washington, D.C. and stop right there on their front steps. Uh, I believe he's going to do it, but he's passionate about that. Um, and, and some people are passionate about Pollux, uh, power and pandemics. Uh, do you know anybody that's been passionate in the last two years about a mask or a vaccine? I don't know if I can think of anyone that's passionate about that kind of stuff. Uh, there have been fights. <laughs> there have been all kinds of nonsense because of people's passion about power and pandemics. What about passionate about... Uh, family, passionate about sports. Uh, Babe Ruth, uh, his jersey sold for $5.6 million, a uh, Babe Ruth jersey. Uh, Marks McGuire's uh, home run ball, the 70th home run ball. Uh, I was in the Navy for four years. I was stationed on the uh, Carl Vinson. It was CBN 70. Uh, during this time, uh, 1998, I was on the aircraft carrier. My ship actually put in a bid for this baseball uh, because it had 70, and we were CBN 70. Uh, but anyway, the ball ended up selling for $3 million for a baseball. Uh, people are passionate about it. If you didn't know this week, uh, the Masters are going on. Uh, it's a golf tournament held in Augusta, uh, Georgia, and there's a guy there named Tiger Woods that's playing this week. Uh, this guy got in a car accident 14 months ago that almost lost his leg. He has rods and screws in his leg. And from the moment he was able to get out of bed, uh, it said several times on the broadcast he didn't take a single day off uh, to work and to fight to get back to this, uh, golf, this golf career that he loves. Uh, do you think that's passionate? Do you think there was passion to drive him uh, to go through all the pain, the ice baths, and all these other things? I am not a, uh, a supporter of, of people that curse on the golf course, people that have not been saved, uh, but this guy is passionate about his sport. Uh, what about Michael Jordan? Uh, one of his Air Jordans sold for almost... Uh, $500,000, I think it was 85 uh, Air Jordans. Uh, people are passionate about the sports, but Michael Jordan, who is a six-time NBA champion, uh, he said this, the greatest thing uh, to the game of basketball is passion and love for it. Because when you have love for anything, you'll go to, do the, you'll go to the extreme to maintain that love. That's what he does. That's what, it, that's what love does. It drives you to do anything to maintain that connection it was truly my love for the game that drove me to be the best basketball player that I could be. To be the best at anything, uh, you got to have a certain love and passion for it to overcome the obstacles that are thrown your way. Uh, that, that's what the game of basketball was for me. Um, and so that's a quote from Michael Jordan. Uh, and we know that most athletes, whether they be Olympians, basketball players, football players, have a devout passion for what they do. If they did not, they would not strive for mastery as what they do. So my question to you this morning is, what are you passionate about? What are you most passionate about in your life? Well, I, I know that it must be uh, somewhat to do with God because you're here this morning. Uh, most Christians, I say most Christians, I don't want to say most Christians, most people are not in church this morning. There's 50,000 people that are going to be on Augusta National watching golf be played this morning. Um, but you're passionate enough to be in church this morning, uh, wanting to glorify God, wanting to worship God in spirit and truth, but you came wanting to hear a message. You wanted to hear something that would stir your heart, maybe to get you closer to God. Maybe you just wanted to come and, and see what the preacher had today, but something motivated you to get out of bed and want to come this morning. So there is a level of passion that you have, but with your passion, is there any way that you could have a stronger passion for God? Could you be more passionate for the things of God? That's the question. Uh, I'm asking the Holy Spirit of God as, as the message goes out, uh, that you ask yourself, am I as passionate for God as I could be, as I ought to be, uh, as I want to be? Now, I'm not excluding faith. I'm not excluding the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Those things are necessary. Faith, uh, being filled with the Spirit of God, but you have to have a level of passion uh, for the things that you do the things that you believe, because if you don't have passion, what's going to happen is you're just going to go through a mundane routine. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but you're going to become lukewarm is what you're going to become. If you don't have a passion for the things that you love, and, and the basis of this whole message is having a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, having a passion for the Word of God, having a passion to want to make sure that you're right with God. 
And so we're going to look at a lot of scriptures this morning, but let me tell you a, an, a, an illustration about passion. Passion uh, in many, in many times is alluded to as a raging fire. Fire actually describes the nature of passion. On one hand, the fire of passion can be used uh, constructively. Uh, if contained, it can help ignite other fires. On the other hand, it can be used to, be, to des- destroy or be destructive to put out fires. Uh, during Desert Storm, Saddam Hussein uh, lit many of the oil wells on fire. Uh, water could be used to no avail to put these fires out nor did anything else work. The massive fires were consumed by other fires created by dynamite. The dynamite literally licked up the oxygen, suffocating uh, and ultimately destroying the once thriving fires. Uh, That's what passion is like. It can either be positive or it can be negative. Uh, Look back with me in Acts chapter 14. We're going to walk down this passage somewhat. Uh, I I want you to look at the, and, and, and maybe we can learn from the testimony of Paul and Barnabas this morning. Uh, The first verse in in Acts chapter 14, it says this, uh, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. All right, so the backstory of this is, I'm going to give it to you in a little while, but basically they were kicked out of a coast. Uh, They were persecuted. uh, They went to Iconium. And surprisingly, the first thing they went to Iconium is they went to the Jewish synagogue. And I'm going to tell you how much passion these people have. They didn't just go to hear They didn't go to uh, just uh, fill in the time. Look what it says right here. They went to the the synagogue of the Jews and so so spake. They had something to say on their hearts. They had a passion for God, a passion for the Lord. They had something to say. Uh, So they were desirous in the synagogue to speak. And what happened because of that passion, uh, it says that a great multitude, both of Jews and also of Greeks, believed. Because that they had this passion, because they had a message, they had something to say, it made a difference between Jews and Greeks. They ended up believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. But look what it says next. It says, but the unbelieving Jews, they stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. I want to park there just for a moment uh, because for every good passion, there's a negative passion. Um, If you love something, you're going to be passionate about it. And I've discovered this over the years. If you hate something, you're passionate about that too. Uh, These unbelieving Jews actually hated what what was taking place. The Jews hated Jesus Christ so much the more where they put him on a cross. Uh, I'm thankful that they did that because he ended up paying my sin debt that I owed to God. But these people were passionate uh, passionate enough now that they're going to stir the minds of the people. Um, I preached the message not too long ago and I did this. This is what they did, propaganda. They got in their minds. I can only imagine the things that they said to these people. Uh, The negative things that they said about uh, Barnabas and Saul, the negative things they said about these believers uh, to the point where it it affected their minds evilly. Propaganda is information, especially on uh, biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view, uh, especially during World War II. You had pictures of, of Germany with swords through Bibles saying, this is the enemy. Uh, the Bible is the enemy. They didn't want anybody having the word of God. You had uh, propaganda in the states to uh, get people to uh, give bonds or buy bonds for money. There was just a lot of propaganda. Uh, I began to study a little bit about the Boxer Rebellion, uh, and, and, and a couple ended up uh, being told lies on that they were, uh, they were stealing children and killing children. And uh, the, uh, the Chinese found out that these folks were Christians, uh, so they marched them for 12 miles, and they were going to execute them publicly. Uh, When they got to the execution, as I was reading this, there was a shopkeeper, a Chinese man who was a shopkeeper. Uh, He went out and pleaded with the security guards that they would not uh, kill uh, the Stenums, that they would not not kill these people. And and what happened is because he put himself out there with the passion to save these folks' life, uh, the uh, Chinese soldiers went into his house, they raided his business, his house, and guess what they found there? They found a Bible. And so what happened is he got uh, right next after uh, uh, Brother Stenum was beheaded, Uh, the wife was killed and then the shopkeeper was killed also. Uh, But there was a passion uh, to do right and the propaganda that was told in World War II and even in the Boxing Rebellion uh, affected the mind's evil. So the question is, do you think that happens today? Do you think that happens about our church? Do you think Madison Baptist Church is talked evil about? Well, we know that's true. Uh, Bad things are told about our church Uh, We have one family in here. I'm not going to look at them. I'll point at them, but I'm not going to look at them. Um, They were at a particular church, 
And the pastor started bad-mouthing us. He started telling them about how uh, those people, they, they, they try to dress right. They think they're better than everybody. They use the King James Bible. They're, they don't go to move. They don't do this. They don't do that. They don't do that. The whole time, the guy was speaking up for us uh, because that brother in Christ said that was the thing that got me to visit Madison Baptist Church. All the negative things that that guy was telling me about your church had a desire for me to come visit that church because I want to see what these people are about. Apparently, they love God. They're serving God. They're serious about God. Let me go see what that church is about. So it was negatively affected. He tried to, to badmouth us, but it ended up, uh, we have a faithful uh, family in our church, and uh, their brothers ended up coming, and some other friends ended up coming. Praise God for people uh, badmouthing. God, God works all things out to good to those that love God. Uh, what about the evil reviews we have on Google about our church? Do you know there's a review on there that says, not that we'll eat your children, but it says we will destroy your families. And that families have been destroyed because they came to Madison Baptist Church. Uh, you've been destroyed because you have someone that loves you enough. Yeah, he, we, we raise our voice from time to time. Uh, I found out most people need, need the voice raises, if not, Amen. and have fallen asleep a little bit. But they have reviews on there that we will destroy your family. It's not true. Uh, we want nothing more than to heal your family, to help your family, to have your family strive for God's glory, to reach other families, because families make up the church. We're not trying to destroy anybody. I'm not trying to destroy anybody. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. If I hurt anybody in the things that I've said, I don't, I don't mean to hurt you. Edification for the building up of the church to do right before God. To do right according to the word of God. That's the exhortation you need from a man of God to challenge you to do right. Because every man is right in his own ways. He goes his own way. You need somebody with a little bit of passion to tell you, don't go that way. Go God's way. It'll work out better for you. Um, having some passion uh, in, in our lives uh, about our church. Uh, uh, someone said this week that we believe that only Madison Baptist church people are going to heaven. They said that. Y'all at that church, that preacher believes that only his church members are going to go to heaven. I'm sorry, that's not true. The only way you can go to heaven, listen to me very carefully, is not being a member of this church. It's to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, you have to make that conscious decision. You have to realize the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And with that conviction, you have to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. They sang a song this morning, you must be born again. Yeah. Repent of all your sin. It's an impossibility to repent of all your sins. And listen to me very clearly, you cannot repent of all your sins. What happens though, is you get under conviction because of the sin debt that you owe to God. And you're under conviction because of that sin. The Holy Spirit uh, convincing you that you've lied, you've stolen, you use God's name in vain, you've robbed from God. You're convinced from that fully from the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And when you're convinced of that, now repentance comes in, which now you turn from those things you are trusting in to save you. You turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, asking him to become your savior by faith. I need you to save me. And then you could say, I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ is my Lord and savior. No other reason will do. So we do not believe only Madison Baptist church people are going to heaven. We don't believe uh, only Baptists are going to heaven. We believe only those that have been born again by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only those folks that can go to heaven. Uh, and if you haven't been born again, I, I want to encourage you, it's a simplistic decision that you have to make. Um, Mo, uh, Jesus used the illustration of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. The, uh, the Israelites ended up getting the snake bite healed. All they had to do was this right here. All they had to do was look. That, I mean, that is absolutely it. The snake bite would have been, been healed. That was not for eternal salvation. It was for the snake bite. All they had to do was look. And Jesus goes right into there. He says, and so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have eternal life. Amen. You must look and live. You must just acknowledge Jesus is who he is. Oh, by the way, let me say this. Um, I grew up Catholic. I, I trusted in a, a, a Jesus who was a white man with long hair and blue eyes. Do you know that's a false Jesus? As I got saved and studied my Bible, guess where Jesus is from? The tribe of Judah. And he could not have been that guy uh, that I worshipped my whole life. It could not have been that guy. Uh, it was idolatry. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to beat up the Catholic this morning. You know why I'm not going to beat him up, Brother Roger? Because I got a hug from a Catholic man this week. That's why I'm not going to beat up the Catholics. Uh, we witnessed to a guy. Uh, his name was, uh, happened to be Dave. Uh, and uh, Dave came out. He wrestled his dog. Dave, I hope you're watching this, this morning. Uh, but Dave ended up uh, wanting to tell us some of the experiences that he had. And he goes into how he experienced this and how he experienced that. Uh, and we, I, I called Dave unusual. 
and there was a long pause. Brother John kind of hit me and says, why are you calling him unusual? That's weird that you're saying that. Uh, but he was a very nice guy. And I said, well, maybe your testimony could be this. And you could replace all of that, which you just told me, and then went right into the gospel message that he would take Christ as personal Savior. Uh, well, he had to go, but he thanked us for being there. And he hugged my neck. Uh, I've had rocks thrown at me from Catholics and doors slammed in my face. I, I, that may have been the first hug that I've gotten out on visitation. from Anyway, uh, I'm just saying that uh, uh, what about in our church? About our church, yes, but what about passion in our church? Uh, about um, uh, propaganda or saying false things? Hold your hand here with me and, and, with me and turn to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I've been alive long enough, I've been saved long enough that we constantly need to hear this message. Uh, we constantly need to uh, read these verses in Proverbs chapter 6. Uh, we need to constantly find out what God hates and make sure that we are not doing it in any shape or fashion or form whatsoever. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16, uh, the Bible says this, These six things that the, that, the, that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. Look at it. Um, Verse 17, we're, we're going to itemize these first, a proud look. God does not want you having a proud look, uh, a lying tongue, period. I don't care what the subject matter is. I don't care how playful it is. You're not to have a lying tongue, period. It, it, God hates it, period. Not to your spouse, not to your church, not to individuals, not playing around, not goofing around, not have a lying tongue. Don't get upset with me because I'm preaching this. Don't get upset with me uh, because I'm passionate about you not having a lying tongue. I'm not to have a lying tongue. My family's not to have a lying tongue. You're not to have a lying tongue. Uh, it goes on. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked imagination. Feet that be sh swift into running into mischief, uh, into mischief. A false witness to speak of lies. He mentions it twice in, the, in this passage of Scripture about lying. This one's about a false witness uh, and it says here, the seventh is an abomination, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Right. This is something we have to constantly be protected of. Right. Uh, you need to keep your opinions to yourself about your brothers and sisters in Christ. Does everybody make the decision that you would make? No, they don't. Does everybody make the right decision? No, they don't. Does everybody make biblical decisions? No, they don't. Keep your mouth shut about it. There's no way that you need to go to another brother and sow discord among this person. Uh, they are still a field with treasure to be reached. They are still a trophy of grace. Uh, give a little space, uh, a little bit of exhortation. Pray for them. But quit trying to badmouth everybody that they don't do everything exactly how you want to do. And give the Holy Spirit space to work. Because he will work on some people to make them what he would have them to be. To, to make them and make all of us in the image of Christ. We have to stop sowing discord. Uh, when I was in the Navy, the, that, that propaganda there, or it would say loose lips sink ships. Uh, so they, we wouldn't want to give our, our, our positions away. We wouldn't uh, want to talk about the things that are happening negatively where the enemy would get a hold of it. And that's what happens when we run our mouth. And every one of us, not one single person in here is immune to this. We all have to protect it. We all have to be passionate about protecting it. If not, we're going to destroy ourselves from within. Because you're going to badmouth the preacher, you're going to badmouth the assistants, you're going to badmouth the deacons, you're going to badmouth the Sunday school teachers, the choir leader, you're going to badmouth everybody if you're not careful. God, it's an abomination to sow discord among brethren. But that's what happens, and that's what these people, back to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. Told you to mark it, and I didn't even mark it. <laughs> All right, we see here, uh, verse 2, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. And then look at the passion of, of Paul and Barnab Barnabas now. It says here in the next verse, Long time, therefore, they abode speaking boldly. That's how they got affected by it by people having propaganda against them and people bad-mouthing them, it encouraged them to speak a long time boldly. What did they speak boldly about? In the Lord and gave testimony unto the word of His grace. How passionate are you for the Bible? How passionate are you for the Word of God? Uh, I'm not going to belabor this point, uh, but I do know this. Uh, the Spirit of God has been moving in our place for the last several weeks. 
uh, whether it be in the messages or in people closing in prayer. Uh, we are hearing it over and over and over again. Help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving our own selves. We're hearing it over and over and over and over again. And listen to me, if you're not passionate about the word of God, you will not be a doer. You'll be a hearer of the word of God, but you'll say that doesn't apply to me. Ah, I don't really. And, and what happens is you do that and you don't even realize you're doing it. There's some subjects in the Bible that are hard to hear, hard to understand about separation and other things, and even about witnessing. And when we don't do those things, we are deceiving our own selves. But being doers of the word, not hearers only, the only way you're going to be a doer of the word is to be passionate about it. You have to be passionate for your love for the Lord Jesus Christ, passionate about, his love, about the word of grace, or you will not be a doer of the word of God. There has to be some passion for you for the word of God. Um, so they, they abode long time uh, preaching the word of God. And then look what happened uh, in verse 5. Uh, in verse 5, uh, the Bible says here, um, when there was an assault made, both the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers, and here's, here's what they de devised, the attack they devised, they were going to use them uh, despitefully. That word despitefully means they were going to abuse them. Uh, they were going to abuse them probably with whips, maybe rods. Uh, they were going to abuse them. And then after they uh, abused them or dis, dis, uh, uh, used them despitefully, uh, then they were going to stone them. That's how, that's how passionate these people are. They're going to beat them. Uh, they're going to abuse them. And then they're going to stone them because they're, they're preaching the word of God. That, that's, a, that's a lot of passion. And look at verse 6. Uh, and they were aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby and cities of, uh, say it, Brother Wally, Laconia? Okay, I was struggling with that word all, all week. Ly Lycaoni, Lycaonia, yeah. They went to that place, and uh, he was helping me, but you didn't help me there. You left me hanging. Thank you. <laughs> Unto the regions that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. So they got so discouraged after this persecution, uh, they went and fled to another place. No, they weren't discouraged at all. They went to the next place, and guess the first thing they started doing? Preaching the gospel. It just, it just happens naturally. Uh, preaching the gospel. And so they were passionate enough. Uh, these people were passionate enough to want to, to, to want to uh, hurt these folks. And it reminded me, as I was meditating on this, it reminded me of the men of Sodom. Uh, do you remember those folks who the, 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 the angels had blinded? Uh, and then they wearied themselves trying to find the door uh, to get to, to these, these angels? Uh, that's some passion for evil. Uh, another time for passion uh, for evil. Pilate, in Luke 23, verse 20 and 21, Pilate, therefore willing, uh, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again to them, but they, they cried, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And they answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. You want to talk about some passion? Uh, they were going to release Jesus Christ. Uh, they were going to release him. And they said, do you want the murderer, Barabbas, or do you want Jesus? And they said, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And what for this Jesus, what would you have me to do for him? And they screamed out, crucify that man. Crucify that man. And his blood be upon us and our children. It reminded me, that also reminded me uh, when Stephen uh, was when they, uh, the Bible says in Acts chapter 7 and verse 40, uh, 54, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on them, on him with their teeth. Uh, they grabbed Stephen and started chewing on this man. That's how angry they were. They started biting this guy and gnashing on him. And then it says, uh, it says uh, uh, in 59, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Uh, so after they gnashed on them and gnawed on them with their teeth, uh, they picked up rocks and they stoned them to death. Uh, that's passion to do evil, just like these men were trying to do uh, to Paul and Barnabas. But they fled. Uh, they fled the danger. And I believe it's found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22 to 23. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ says this, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over uh, the city of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And so they fled in the danger. Uh, they fled in the storm. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, if you would. Uh, fleeing when there's danger. This is a wise thing. Uh, I do a lot of uh, gospel witnessing, uh, just begging people to accept Jesus as their Savior. 
I do not carry a knife, a gun. I do, I do not even carry my fist. I'm not fighting anybody at those doors. I've decided this. If somebody gets violent out on door knocking, out on visitation, wherever I'm at, I am not going to fight back. But you know what I'm going to do? Brother Murray, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run. I'm going to run faster than you, brother, whole factor. <laughs> I'm going to get out of there. But that's what these guys did. Uh, they saw danger. They got out of there. Here's the problem, though. Uh, when, when the storms come in life, uh, yeah, we may flee, okay? But we're not going dis- to get discouraged in those storms. Uh, we have to have passion to live and love the Lord Jesus Christ no matter the things that happen in our life. In Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, the Bible says this. And the same day when even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over to the other side. This is Jesus speaking now. He's talking to his his disciples. He he gave commandment. This is is Jesus again. Let us pass over to the other side. It's pretty much a done deal at this, this point. Once they get on the boat, guess what they're doing? They're passing over to the other side. There's no stopping it now. God God is on board in the ship with them. God is, God is going with them. They are going to the other side, period. Amen. So there is confidence in that. There's assurance in that. No matter what happens, look what happens in the story. And when they had sent away the multitude, uh, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there uh, were also with them other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind and waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. All right, so we have some danger here. Very windy. I, I can give testimony. I'm, I'm, I don't have time for all that, but when it got wavy out on that aircraft carrier, that was something to behold. Um, and normally we, f- we found the weather because jets take off better in headwinds. Uh, matter of fact, weather gives covering, so we follow the storms around all the time. That, it, it was unbelievable, some of that stuff. Um, anyway, a lot of people getting sick on that ship, but on this one, uh, wind uh, hitting the boat, water is coming inside the boat, and they're very frightful now. Uh, and and it, it goes on to say, uh, And there rose a great storm of wind, and waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, To me, this is the most unusual question in the whole Bible. I don't know that there's a more unusual question in all of Scripture, but this is what they told Jesus Christ. They said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? I can look in each one of your faces and tell you right now that God does care whether you perish or not. Every one of you, God wants to give eternal life, wants to save. The storms may be uh, wavy and the wind may be blowing, but listen, if you come to Jesus Christ, you will not perish. You'll have everlasting life. It is a free gift that God gives, but you know what? The storms of life will, will, will make the waters where you can't see clearly. Uh, it, it will make the, the circumstances of your life where you can't think clearly. Uh, but you know what? In that storm that you go through, he is he's asleep on the pillow. He's in that boat with you. Do not be dismayed. Do not worry. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have faith and love and trust, and you be passionate for God because he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And... We're not even going to read the rest of it, but I'm going to tell you what he did. He says, why have you of so little faith? Jesus got up from that pillow, and he said, peace be still. And the, the very winds and the storms of the disciples' life listened to him, and the winds laid down immediately. And it scared them half to death. They said, what manner is a man is this that even the wind obey his voice? The winds do obey the voice of Jesus Christ. Uh, All are subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every tongue, every knee, uh, at some point we all bow, bow to him. He is powerful. Even in the storm of your life right now, do not forget the fact that God is on board in your ship with you. Uh, He will not leave you or forsake you. You need to be reminded of that so that you can be passionate for him. Because when your faith is increased, your love is increased, I guarantee your passion will be increased uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Uh, there is an expected end when you go through the storm with Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, uh, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. There's an end coming to every storm that we go through. There's an expected end. And we're just going to have faith in God to believe that that end is coming soon. And in that storm, we're just going to have passion to love him, to live for him, to obey him. And, and all those other things because he is worthy of all that. Uh, so back to our text in, in Acts chapter 14. Good thing I numbered my notes. Anyway, I'll just go to... The Acts chapter 14, Uh, we have to fast forward this story uh, because we're going to run out of time. But it says, and when the people saw, or let's go to, uh, uh, they preached the gospel. uh, Verse 8, there sat a certain man at Lystria, impotent, yeah, in his feet. He was crippled, uh, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. Uh, The same heard Paul speak, uh, same heard Paul speak who steadfastly beholding him. And perceived that he had faith to be healed. Said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. All right, so we see some uh, some passion here from the man listening to the message of Paul. Uh, He hadn't walked since he was born. Uh, He's hearing the message. He's listening. Uh, He has faith. God doesn't heal like this anymore. This was a sign to unbelieving Israel. God does still heal as he wills. Matter of fact, he tells you if you're sick, you call the elders of the church, have them uh, anoint you and pray for, uh, pray for you. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, God can heal like this. Uh, he just doesn't choose to heal like this anymore. But, I'm, but what, the point I'm making is that this man got healed. Uh, he was passionate to listen. Uh, he was passionate to heal. And, and look at some passion of some heathen right here. Uh, it says here now in verse 11, when the people saw uh, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice saying uh, in the speech of Brother Wally, Lyconians, all right, the speech of the Lyconia, uh, the gods are come down to us in likeness of men. So this is what they say, the gods are come down in the likeness of men, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Not only that, but he was a shorter guy. Uh, Mercurius here is Mercury, uh, who in the Roman language is Hermes. Hermes was the uh, deliverer of messages for the gods. He wore a a winged hat because he gave messages for the gods. That's why they called him Hermes. Uh, Jupiter was for Barnabas. That that was Zeus and the Roman. These things are not important. I'm just telling you a little background. Uh, His name was Zeus because I believe he was a bigger man, Barnabas. Uh, But anyway, that's what they they named him. Uh, Then the priests of Jupiter, uh, which was before their city, brought oxen and garland unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, uh, they rent their clothes. Now, I have to stop right there. I, this is not our culture. I looked it up. Uh, the, the Jews still do this. If, if uh, somebody they love died, uh, a spouse, they'll cut their shirt a little bit on the right, and so during the funeral, they'll rip their shirt. And then somebody will bring a napkin or a cloth to cover so they're not immodest. If a child or somebody dies, they'll, they'll cut the other part so they can rip it. Uh, but that's not what these guys are doing. But I, I started laughing when I started thinking about that, although it's not funny. I know it's not funny. This is uh, a sign of seriousness for God, uh, repentance. Uh, this, this is a serious thing. But I, I got to thinking, uh, they went in there ripping their clothes and say, don't do this, men. Uh, they came in renting their clothes. Uh, they had some passion because they did not want an oxen slaughtered on their behalf. They did not want any worship that was uh, due given to God. So they came in passionately saying, sirs, do not do not do this. Do not do this at all. Uh, look, it goes on to say, uh, it says here, and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We also of men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from the vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and the things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Number, verse 16 is why I'm not a Calvinist, by the way. Uh, God gave a free will to men to walk in their own ways. And what they did is they disobeyed him every time they were left to their own devices. 
every time. But God gave space because he's a gracious God for us to have free will. With that free will comes awesome responsibility. We make choices every day that could harm us or help us, that could bless us or curse us. We make decisions about God every day. Uh, you have to make a decision about your salvation and your eternal life. Uh, but God gives you a free will to make that decision. What decision are you going to make this morning? Are you going to be passionate about him? I'm not closing right now. I'm just saying that, that this is the message that he gives in verse 17. It says, uh, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful season, filling our hearts with food and gladness. I could not help but think of that song, Ain't God Good. Uh, the words go like this, ain't God good to give us so many blessings, undeserving. That's what we are. We ought to thank him, love and praise him a little more today and a whole lot more tomorrow because of how good God is. That's the message they gave. And, and let me remind you that God is good. Amen. God is love. Can I tell you this with all assurance and all of my fiber of my being that God loves you? I can say that with every ounce of my being, and he demonstrated that love. And, and, and Romans chapter eight, or chapter 5 and verse 8, but God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God proved and demonstrated his love for you when he went to the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you with a godly love, and he's just, he wants this. He wants your faith to trust in him, he wants your love, and he wants you to trust him with all your heart. That's what God wants from you. Uh, be passionate about that because God is passionate toward us. Uh, and I'm going to close with this last verse. Um, if you'll turn with me over to Revelation chapter 2. God is passionate toward us to save us, to give us gifts, to give us the gift of eternal life. It's only by grace through faith that you can get that gift. That gift is a free, free gift offered to God today. Uh, here in a moment, when we have the invitation, we're going to have a couple preachers standing up here. Uh, one is, uh, is, is Pastor Wally Bryant. The other is Pastor John Ross. Uh, don't ask Brother Wally to help you with the name of a city, but he will help you, uh, direct you, and point you to somebody that can lead you in the Word of God to trust Christ as your Savior if you've never done that. All you have to do is get out of your pew, come up here, and let him know privately and quietly. We'll, we'll take you in a room and show you Look, we're not just preaching this. We're showing you from the scripture. This is what Jesus Christ did. And today you could bow your heart in prayer and ask Jesus Christ to save you. That's going to be in a moment. Uh, but God is passionate towards you to get your heart. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So I'm begging you now before we even start the invitation that you would step out. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, when that invitation time comes that you step out. And, and listen, one of those preachers will meet you halfway. When you start walking down that aisle, they'll meet you halfway. Uh, they'll give you over to somebody that will show you in the word of God. I just ask you to come during the invitation as the spirit of God moves. But when we look at the, 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 the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2, uh, this is to the church and us being a, a, a passionate toward God. Uh, we have to have revival in our passion uh, toward God because he says this in chapter 2. He says, starting in the first verse, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Ephes Brother Wally, could you help? Ephesus, okay. Uh, Write these things, saith the, 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 hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them to be liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Is your passion for the Lord Jesus Christ what it should be today? Are you as passionate for him as when you first got saved? Are you passionate for him like you should be? Uh, look at chapter 3 here, uh, beginning of verse four, uh, 13. Uh, he that hath ear, let him hear uh, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this is speaking to our churches, even though it's to the seven churches of Asia Minor there. Uh, but it's to our church, unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, saith the amen, and the faithful and true witness, the beginning uh, of the, uh, the creation of God, I know at thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. He says, you're not cold or, or on fire for me. I would that you were cold or hot, so then because thou, art not, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. We have to get into a place where we have need of everything. 
We need God to meet our needs for breath, for food, for money, for, for love, for patience. God needs to meet every one of our needs. We cannot get to a place where we're satisfied. We have everything that we have, and that's just good enough. No, we have to get back on fire for God, on fire for the truth of his word, on fire to reach the lost, on fire to glorify him. What are you passionate about this morning? What would your bank account say that you're passionate about? We looked at your records on the last, the last thing that you spent money on, car, golf clubs, fishing stuff, uh, books, purses, shoes. What are you passionate about this morning? Are you passionate uh, for God as you could be? Is there any room for revival? Is there any room where you could be more passionate for God than you are today? If there is, make a decision in your heart to ask him to forgive you, to help you, to light the fire that is in you if you're not born again and you're not saved Listen, God loves you and we love you and we want you to just come forward so we can show you in the word of God so that you're not deceived by religion like I was for so many years. So if you would, bow your head, close your eyes.